My name is Adil Ahmed. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Purdue University. This work has been done by our group at Purdue University. Uh, and of course, we're all affiliated with Sarayas. So that is me, Adil Ahmed, Kyongte uh, Kim, Mohammed Ehsanul Haq Sarfaraz, and our advisor, uh, Byung Young Ti. So let's start with a very simple scenario. Suppose that there is a, there's a regular user who wants to store some sort of sensitive databases in, a, in any sort of cloud system. So what the user so since the user is not really naive, the user knows that he cannot technically trust the cloud provider and neither can he trust the other tenants within the system. The user simply realizes that, oh wait, I heard that Intel has been working on something called Intel SGX, which can be used to provide security within a cloud system. And the user says, okay, let me just ensure that all my databases are SGX protected, are within SGX protected enclaves, and what the user thinks is that the cloud provider is actually crying right now and thinking that, oh, okay, now I can't really do anything. And the user realizes there are, you know, thanks a lot, SGX. And, uh, well, the user realizes there are more important things in life and moves on. But do not quote me on this. The real world is a little bit more complicated than that. To just understand why this is, let's go ahead and have a, let me provide a brief background on what Intel SGX actually does. So what SGX actually does is it simply creates a small trusted region within a regular program's address space, which is called the enclave. So what the enclave space is, is, is a space where you can just execute your code and store your data in a trusted manner. So what do we mean by a trusted manner? What the SGX processor does is it, it simply restricts access to any other system component the OS, the VMM, BIOS, et cetera, onto this memory region. So as far as everyone is concerned, or as far as the program is concerned, only the, only the processor can actually access this region, and no other system component can access this region. But the problem is that when you think about it, the program doesn't really use, or doesn't always use code or data within its own sphere. For example, one of the most important thing is that you have to perform system calls. So one of uh, the most important uses of system calls is to access files, for example. So let's have a look at how SGX can, can just uh, access files. So as uh, enclave programs are just regular programs, they're ring three, they're, they're, they only have ring three privilege. So that means that they have to access the file system or they have to access the disk using the ring three system, which is, again, the operating system. But within the SGX threat model, the operating system is untrusted and what the operating system can do is if you have a native file system like a, re like a regular program, the operating system simply knows what you're trying to access. It simply knows which, what file you're trying to access. It simply knows what file offset within the file you're trying to access. So as, so as far as I hope everyone can see that this is a security threat right there. So there's been previous, previous work that has somehow shown that you, can, you should just buffer the complete file or whatever file contents you're going to use you have to initialize them within the enclave and then dump them at the end of the processing back to the disk. So this is called the in-memory file system compared to just a native file system. This file system would be amazing. It would be the best possible file system if there weren't side channels within SGX. So let's have a look at how side channels are going to affect the performance of this file system. So let's suppose that you have this file that you've buffered within the enclave, which is data.txt, and the operating system, of course, is the attacker in this scenario. So for example, if the enclave tries to access a, a certain blocks within this file, certain offsets within this file, they're going to leak information using the page table because uh, the processor is going to set the access bit on the pages that you are accessing, and you're also going to leave, leave traces in the cache, which again, the operating system or even other unprivileged attackers can actually see which, which, which cache, cache set you are actually using. So we have a bunch of uh, attacks, uh, attack papers against SGX in the past that have shown that this is possible. So moving on, so, so far we've just talked about um, generic side channels. So how does this uh, fit into the file system operations? So for example, let's, uh, we, we did a case study on attacking SQLite, which is a popular database application. So let's say you have a doctor who wants to save some sensitive database containing some uh, patient information in the cloud system. What the uh, doctor does is, is that he has, a, he has a bunch of queries that he wants to 
run on the database, and the database is SGX protected, but the cloud provider knows a little bit about the database uh, and has some sort of information about the database. So for example, first, uh, so let's move ahead. What the attacker would see in this scenario is based on the query, SQLite or any application for that matter is going to perform a very specific sequence of file system operations, which can be used where if you have a native file system, you can simply uh, log the system calls. Or if you have an in-memory file system, you're going to have a very specific set of page, page fault or page table patterns. So again, if you have another query, which is, let's say, Alice's hot history, then you would have a very specific set of system call patterns and, again, page fault patterns. So using this attack, we actually figured out that you can, you, that the attacker can figure out which row and which column in a SQLite database has been accessed just by, having, just by looking at either system call patterns or page fault patterns. So the whole point is that as long as there are predictable access patterns, and uh, it, it, despite file operations, you are going to leak sensitive information if you have predictable access patterns in any sort of operations. So now the question is, what should we do about this? What should we do? So these uh, sort of attacks have been known in the past. So one of the observations that we've made is that there aren't, there aren't only a single side channel attack that you can simply mask or you can simply hide those side channels. So SGX has been known to be vulnerable against multiple side channels. So if you want to mask a single side channel, you're going to try to hide the side channel patterns. It is a risky approach. Uh, the second thing is, the whole, the whole thing about all memory-based side channels is that they have predictable access patterns. If you can somehow sort of randomize those access patterns, then technically you would be, you, you would, uh, you would, you would be doing well. So, how to provide those strong protections uh, while ensuring that we're not actually trying to hide access patterns. In fact, we're actually giving out all access patterns. So one of the possible solutions is Oblivious RAM. So what is Oblivious RAM? So what Oblivious RAM does is that there is a user who wants to store some sort of uh, security sensitive data blocks, A, B, C, D, E, F, in a cloud system. And what the attacker wants to do, uh, the attacker could be the cloud provider in this scenario, what the attacker wants to do is to just simply find out when a user is going to access a certain block, try to find out which, which of these blocks was actually accessed. So Path ORAM is an improved variant of Oblivious RAM, which is a fairly recent version uh, proposed in CCS 12. So it has a tree-based ORAM formulation where uh, on the server side or the untrusted side, you're going to hold uh, uh, real and dummy blocks, user blocks, in an encrypted format, of course. And on the, on the client side, what you're going to have is a position map, number one, a position map, which stores the position of a specific block in the ORAM server. For example, A says 0, 0. So that means that if you read the path 0, 0 in the ORAM tree, you would be able to get, you be, be able to access the block A. And this stash is just a small memory, not a moderate memory region, where you're going to be storing the blocks that you get from it, from the ORAM tree. So I, I'm not going to go much deeper into what Path ORAM does, but what it simply does is it, you're going to access multiple blocks and you're always going to randomize your next access so that the next time you access it, it would be from a, from a different path. So I would recommend reading the paper to understand more how Path ORAM works, but I will not, unfortunately, I, can, I cannot go into the details for it. So I hope everyone remembers this scene. This is from Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. So Obliviate is actually one of the memory incantations used by Hermione in, in Harry Potter. So in this, if, if you remember this scene, what Hermione is actually doing is, is she's actually trying to erase the memory of her parents so that they cannot let Lord Voldemort to blackmail her or, or, or figure out where um, Hermione actually is. So very, in a very similar sense, for us, the cloud provider is technically Lord Voldemort. The operating system is technically our parents. And Hermione is technically us. And we want to obliviate the operating system so that the operating system cannot actually leak uh, the information to the attacker, which is the cloud provider. So this is the basis of why this is called obliviate. Um, so, well, so Obliviate is a memory charm against the operating system. So in this scenario, we have two different enclaves. First one is the application enclave on the left, and on the right, you have the file system enclave. 
which is Obliviate. So first of all, what, uh, I'm going to provide a brief overview of the workflow of Obliviate, and then I'm going to explain each individual components uh, one by one. So first of all, you're going to load all the files into the ORAM, uh, into the Obliviate file system, uh, the process, uh, the file system enclave, but outside, I will explain why. Then uh, afterwards, what is going to happen is we install a very small library, which we call the trusted proxy, inside the application enclave to intercept all file system related system calls. And after that, since these are two separate processes, we create an encrypted channel between these two processes, um, of course, using uh, standard IPC mechanisms. And then we provide that query to Obliviate, which is sort of our trusted library, which is going to perform data oblivious handling of uh, whatever file system operations. And we, perf we perform uh, an optimization, which is called an asynchronous ORAM operation. And at the end, we will retrieve the required block or from the required file of, from the required file, the required file offset, and then return it back from the pathway we just came from. So this is a uh, this is a brief overview of what Obliviate does. In uh, okay, so the first the first part of it is that we want to decouple. The first design decision is that we want to decouple the file system support from the application. We cannot expect the uh, enclave developer to perform secure file system operations for each individual enclave that that he or she creates. So what we want is that we want multiple ap application enclaves to simply contact a central point, very similar to how Linux operating system and other operating system pr provide file system, um, file system support. So we will pass all file system, uh, system calls using an encrypted channel through to, the, uh, uh, through to the Obliviate enclave. And we will allow Obliviate to worry about uh, you know, securing the access of uh, within files. So separation of function will obviously facilitate application development. So now, to how, do we, how do we ensure that this happens where the application developer doesn't have to write some certain source, some certain different source type of source code? So first of all, we install the trusted proxy, which is a very small library, which simply intercepts all file system related system calls and encrypts those uh, requests and also patches them to make them equal in size. So uh, why do we have to encrypt them? That is because now since we are going to go outside the enclave, because we cannot, uh, two enclaves cannot directly contact each other, you have to go through the operating system using standard uh, in, uh, inter-process communication channels. So you have to ensure that whatever communication that is done outside the enclave is encrypted. So we use uh, exitless message queues uh, similar to some of the previous work, and then we create an encrypted channel. So we create an encrypted channel between these two processes the application process and the Obliviate process, which of course both are, um, are um, uh, enclave applications. So in the end, there are no changes. So how do we secure ORAM? So first of all, now you have the, now you have the request from the application. You have to store the metadata in the enclave. Now, Obliviate's enclave is not side channel resistant either. So how are we going to ensure that what the application enclave couldn't do, what we're going to do, what, how can we do it then? So for example, if you want to load an index from the position map, you're going to definitely leave some memory traces in the page table and the cache, which can be used to defeat ORAM. So what we do is we, we use conditional move. Conditional move is an x86 instruction, which, is going to, which provides uh, either real or fake access based on a flag, but despite real or fake access, it leaves the exact same memory traces. So as a result, from the attacker's perspective, we will be accessing every single index within the, uh, within the position map. So uh, the attacker cannot distinguish, any memory-based attacker cannot distinguish C move from move. And therefore, we have a site channel resistant ORAM implementation. So the next part is that we have to understand that as, if you have larger enclaves, you will be degrading performance. That has been shown that because the EPC or the, the way that the SGX is designed it is supposed to have very small uh, physical memory. So it, you can extend that memory, but as you extend the memory, the performance degrades exponentially. So what we do is we ensure that the small metadata is kept inside the enclave and the larger ORAM trees are kept outside the enclave, thereby ex using uh, custom encryption, of course, if you have to keep them outside the enclave. So we also leverage asynchronicity. This is something a uh, little weird because this is we, what we ensure is that uh, we can perform half part of ORAM using a background thread 
And at the same time, we can reply to the request, thereby ensuring that we have a log of n less uh, stoppage time for the application. Uh, this is a bit confusing, but I would really recommend reading the paper to understand how this works using a background thread. So uh, we perform asynchronous ORAM right back. So our implementation uh, shows that Oblivion is just uh, built upon the Intel SGX SDK library, and we perform a Graphene SGX integration. Graphene SGX is a lib OS to just run heavyweight applications, but our whole implementation is based on the trusted Intel library. So we perform a, 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 a evaluate our prototype against the native file system and the in-memory file system. So we show that against the in-memory file system, we have very little, very little overhead, two to three times overhead only uh, over the in-memory file system. That is because the in-memory file system, as you can remember, keeps everything within the enclave, which means that it is going to exert a lot of pressure on the EPC. Since that would happen, then the in-memory file system is already extremely slow. But again, compared to the native file system, we have a degree of performance overhead, which is expected since Obliviate performs secure ORAM operations, whereas native file system would just simply access a one block out of the whole file. So even in macro benchmarks, we show that compared to the in-memory file system, our system is more secure, definitely, and, and does not have as much overhead as uh, could be. So, um, so in conclusion, what we show is that all existing SGX uh, file systems are vulnerable to various side channels. We show that file system operations, because of their predictable nature, can, there, can definitely leak sensitive information about a program's execution. And we also show that Obliviate uses uh, PathORAM to ensure theoretically strong defense against side channel attacks. We will be open sourcing our implementation soon over here, and this is my contact information. Thank you so much for listening to the talk. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, Teho from Magic Cube. Um, looking at your proposal, have you guys looked at um, different types of cryptographic methods, such as functional encryption, to see how well your your, your proposal will work against that or how it improves functional against Functional encryption? That? No, we haven't actually looked against functional encryption, but uh, I'm guessing, no, we haven't. So far, we haven't. This is something that we definitely should look forward to in the future, but no, no not so far. Yeah. If you have, all right. 